what is the thing that you're afraid of when it comes to money? And then write it down. And then the next prompt is, I'm afraid of this because... And then read it out loud and then challenge it. This show is dedicated to helping you strengthen your family tree and live financially free. Welcome to the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, everybody. This is Andy Hill. And today we're talking about why fear can actually be a blessing. During my short 40-ish years on the planet, fear and anxiety have played a big part in my life. When I got a house with a big mortgage with my wife, I feared that if I got fired from my job, we would lose our house. And me and my wife and my kids, we would wander the streets aimlessly in search of our next meal. <laughs> While this dire prospect was quite hyperbolic. To me, it was a constant fear of mine. Now, while that fear wasn't fun, the positive side of those panicky feelings were that they drove me to pay off our mortgage early and start my own business so I wouldn't have to worry about getting fired or losing our house ever again. So evidently, fear can motivate. To help us explore more about the benefits of fear, I've invited author and financial expert Farnoosh Tarabi back to the show today. Farnoosh is one of America's leading personal finance experts and the host of the award-winning podcast, So Money, that has earned over 25 million downloads. She is a sought-after speaker and author of multiple books, including her latest, entitled A Healthy State of Panic, Follow Your Fears to Build Wealth, Crush Your Career, and Win at Life. When Farnoosh isn't inspiring people to follow their fears, she's spending time with her husband and two children on the East Coast. Welcome back to the show, Farnoosh. Andy, thank you so much. It's great to reconnect. And I love your story about how fear motivated you. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Well, perfect. Well, I yeah. thought I'd share a little bit because, you know, conversations like this are a little bit of uh, you putting yourself out there. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing on the show. So I figured I'd, I'd start and, uh, and open the conversation that way. Let, let's talk about fear in general. Why is our first human instinct so fear-based? Well, fear is a survival instinct, right? If you and I would not be here podcasting had <laughs> fear not been an element in our lives. And in the primitive era, it was there to protect us literally from life and death, running from the woolly mammoths. You get the picture, the Flintstones. Uh, we've evolved. And so I think has our relationship with fear, or, or so I like to think, I think we're capable at least of evolving that relationship. Some of us are still stuck in those primitive era, thinking that when fear shows up, it, the response is, is just either to run, hide, duck, or stay still, you know, the, the fear flight. To answer your question, I think that it is, you know, it is an emotion that is there for a reason. We often just want to focus on the happiness and the joy parts of life, which I think, of course, are important. But just like fear, joy can be misleading. It can blind us. Fear can be blinding. Happiness can be blinding. But happiness can be wonderful and fear can be wonderful. And I think that we are not having enough of the conversation about how to flip fear and look at it more as a tool and less as something that is there to get in the way. Like, I actually don't know when the message got muddled, but I have to think that, it, you know, as far back as FDR's speech, his inauguration speech during the Great Depression, when he told financially despondent Americans, hungry, poor Americans, you have nothing to fear but fear itself. I think we have ventured a campaign against this idea of being fearful as weakness, that mm. we couldn't possibly live in a world where we could be afraid and fulfilled. We cannot be scared and successful. It's a zero sum game. If you're afraid, you've lost the deal. You've lost, you've lost out on so many opportunities. I I disagree. And I think hmm. that if we are honest with ourselves, we will see the patterns in our own decision making too, that how we reconciled with fear, we unpacked fear, we related to fear. And that's how we got on the other side. It wasn't because we fought it, that we denied it. I, in my experience, anything that you fight only becomes bigger. Anything yeah. you try to hide returns. And so we have to learn how to deal with this emotion that I think at the end of the day is trying to save us. I think that's great. I, you know, I think for so long, uh, you know, when I say, oh, I, you know, I, I financial anxiety or it's, mm -hmm. you know, something that I'm, you know, not proud of, but you know what? It propels you. It can propel you. It can push you in a way. Talk to us about your story about maybe, maybe why this was so motivating oh for you to gosh. write this book about why fear can motivate. Well, as I say, the story starts early for me. I was the poster girl for fear. 
I was, uh, I'm Iranian. My parents are immigrants from Iran and we have a word in Farsi called Tarsu, which means fearful one. It's typically a word reserved for kids. The kid, you know, you, I was that kid who uh, was afraid of strangers and being abducted and loneliness and being rejected and trying new things and putting myself out there. And I was Tarsu, little Tarsu. It's the first story mm -hmm. in the book because I think it left an imprint. Fast forward to adulthood, I'm still scared. And I think now I'm dealing with more adult fears like money and failure and things like uncertainty that could actually, you know, like layoffs and, and all the uncertainties in life, in relationships and everywhere. And I become a financial expert. <laughs> as you are, you know, you become an author and a researcher and a writer and all that, and you're helping people. And I have to say that in the 25 years that I have been working in personal finance, when people come to me with their financial conundrums, the underpinning of all of those questions, the emotional underpinning is fear. Mm -hmm. So I say I, I have been professionally working with fear for 25 years. I have personally had to reconcile with fear myself for 43 years. So I have a very personal relationship with fear. I have a very professional understanding of fear. And, and I think as an author, and this is my fourth book, it's been nine years. I think I had a lot of PTSD from that last one. It's a lot of work, <laughs> as you know. And I think that your responsibility for your reader is to move the dial, offer something that pushes the envelope a little bit, pushes the discourse to a new level. And I think we are ready for more conversations about money and mental health. And fear, again, is something that I think really deserves a rebrand. We deserve it to ourselves to look at our fears as valid. And from there, use fear as the empowered, agency-driven adults that we are to, to use it as a tool to, to make healthier choices. I, I like to say that when we face our fears, what we're really doing is we're facing ourselves. When fear shows up in your life, in your financial life, in your career, anywhere, it's really trying to nudge you towards protecting something you care about. and. I think that's a gift. I think there's so much wisdom in that. Too often in, in life, we are misguided. We are following someone else's measure of success or a goalpost that we didn't plant, but here we are trying to reach for it. And I think when you're afraid of pursuing things in life, maybe it's because you are misguided. Maybe it's because you aren't looking inward to find the real ways of getting to a place where you feel for yourself secure Fear is very personal. It's also very universal. And that's why in the book, I don't just talk about fear as this monolith, like this one emotion that is all encompassing. I think that it's important to really drill down and look at fear in all the shapes and sizes of fear, all the ways that fear can present itself in our lives. So fear of money is one and it's central to the book. But I start with some of the fears that we experience as early as childhood and kind of go chronologically through life because fear kind of grows up with you and the fears evolve and the fears mature. So in the beginning, it's like the fear of rejection and fear of loneliness. Then it's FOMO. I mean, I'm still dealing with FOMO, but I think it starts when you, as soon as you discover you can open up a, a TikTok or a, <laughs> an Instagram <laughs> or you're on Facebook. And then we get into things like the fear of money and uncertainty. And the last chapter is the fear of losing your freedom, which I don't know what's more high stakes than that. And I don't mean like fear of, you know, losing your, you know, your democratic constitutional freedoms, but just in our own personal lives, what are your, what are the things that you consider very personally important to you that are, that define feeling free? You know, for me, it's like being able to make money to be able to have financial autonomy, to be able to marry who I want. And that's going to be, again, different for everybody. But identifying that is what the fear of losing your freedom is really first nudging you towards. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited about this book. I feel like when we talk about money, we talk about life and our role in it. And this book is an opportunity to, you know, start by talking about money, but then really like grow and expand from there. I think as you know, we we both have these financial podcasts, but it's not all we talk about. <laughs> We're Absolutely. talking about everything else. Yeah, it's the it's the mask of money that uh, mm -hmm. that that leads you into these other conversations. You know, I, I think you're you're hitting at something that I, I think is uh, very interesting. For so long, I've um, set goals personally, and I know I, I encourage people to set goals because those help you to move towards things. But then I've also heard this concept of uh, not just goal setting, but like fear setting, mm. where it's like you you kind of lean into the things that you know, that maybe give you those fears or that mm -hmm. anxiety. Do you think that is maybe something that we should 
consider doing instead of yes. maybe looking at big goals or looking at <laughs> what other people are doing and maybe look at fear setting instead? Yeah. I mean, I have a personal story around this. I was yes, afraid. Please. Yeah. So how this book even came to be was driven by fear. I did some stand-up comedy in 2018 as a way to, I guess, challenge myself. It was a terrifying thing and I knew it was going to be terrifying going in, but I also felt like it was worth it. You know, I mean, it was a low stakes thing. It wasn't like I was trying to get a Netflix special, although that would be great. I wasn't trying to make a career out of it. It was just a hobby, an excuse to get out of the house and not change diapers for an evening. At the time, my kids were very young and I loved it so much. And I was scared every time I got up and grabbed the mic. And at the end of the, it was a course, it was like a stand-up comedy workshop, eight weeks intensive. At the end of that, they give you the a venue to invite your friends to come. And you're like, you're doing it. You're like on wow. the stage with your six minute set bombing, not bombing. I mean, it was a pretty warm crowd because it's everyone you've invited. So everyone's here for uh, supporting you. But it was for me a fear-driven experiment that ended up taking me to places I never imagined, chiefly this book. I went on stage and I talked about the fears I had growing up as a kid, not even realizing that there was maybe a story, a bigger narrative here, but just that my the irony of my parents who risked everything to come to the United States, they demonstrated so much risk tolerance and fearlessness and yet they come here and they are like done with taking risks. They are done <laughs> with <laughs> flirting with fear. They're like, I mean, we're going to raise you to just stay home. That's it. That's like how you live a secure, safe, successful, prosperous life. Don't leave the house. And so that's funny, but it's also telling a bigger story about, you know, my comeuppance with fear as my sidekick. And a literary agent reached out after she watched my amateur stand-up comedy that I posted on Facebook just so that my parents could mainly watch, but she watched it too. And I was scared even doing that because again, like mm -hmm. who's going to watch this and I'm going to get heckled on Facebook. And she said, this is really interesting material. You're funny. Like, is there more of this? Because she's scouting, right, for book ideas. And I said, sure. Do you mean written down or like, because it's all in my head. I live this. It's I've got tons of more of this material. And she's like, yeah, I'd love for you to start writing and and show me what you get, what you what you develop. And I so I did. But it took many years. I mean, that was 2018. In the middle of that came a pandemic. But she kept on nudging me. And there were many times where I was just like, I'm not doing this. You know, I'm not going to put my life out there. And I just feel like sometimes in life you have to trust the shepherding. If someone or, or some things are just pushing you to in a certain direction and you're afraid, maybe you kind of flirt with it and you go and see how far it goes. I mean, this was, I try to control everything in my life, Andy. And this, I, I feel like I had no control over mainly because I don't think I saw the vision and my literary agent and my publisher did. And I, I thank them so much for firstly, really like letting me know I could trust them. So it really came down to trust, but yeah, I, uh, I did that scary thing and it led to this this other where I am today, where I'm, I'm, I have a book. And I think that there's a story even in the book about the fear of failure. And how oftentimes we don't do something because we're afraid it's going to come back to haunt us or we're not going to be successful. And that's not cool. And that's disappointing. And sometimes failing is the point I write. And this is actually advice from my friend, Karen Rinaldi, who wrote a book called uh, You Should Suck at Something. And for her, it was surfing. And she loves to surf. She's terrible at it. But she said, you know what? It's not about the outcome. For me, it's about the process. It's the ritual. It's the journey. It's like putting my surf suit on, hitting the waves, the sea, the sea salt, all of that. Like that for her, the experience is the thing. It's not the what happens after that, which is usually a crash. And I feel like that's such a great piece of wisdom. I think too often in life, again, we try to just go for the, the wins, the sure bets. And I guess what I'm really saying is take a risk, but a low stake one. Yeah. Because then I think it, it just flexes that muscle so that when you're afraid of something bigger, you almost have a little bit more emotional intelligence and strength around navigating that. So 
intentionally going for the fearful things, the low stakes one is is often a, a good exercise in preparing you for life's bigger what ifs. I think that's fantastic. I think it's uh, it says so many things. I think that we are it's so comfortable to to stay at home, like 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 mom said, and or to be able to just kind of do the comfort comforting thing, watch the Netflix show or whatever. Personally, in our own lives, that uh, it makes it difficult for us to want to touch on fear or the the opportunities that fear might present to us. I I, I believe we've talked about this in the past. My my wife's uh, mother was from Baghdad, so she has a lot of the same upbringing of stay at home, don't go anywhere. You're <laughs> safe here. You are safe here. Right. So so we uh, my wife and I have a lot of these types of conversations, but the conversations we have too are about, you know, stepping outside of our comfort zone to try to do things that are new. And let, let's talk about, let's talk about that with the parents that are listening right now. I mm -hmm. think that quite often, you know, we've, we got married, we've got the kids, uh, you know, that's comfortable, try to eliminate and decrease the amount of anxiety and chaos becomes part of our modus operandi. But maybe it's good to invite a little bit in so that we can go where we want to go. Talk to us about maybe some challenges that parents face out there with regard to their personal finances, knowing that you've been doing this for so long. Mm -hmm that could uh, benefit from leaning into the fear. Yeah. I mean, so often I hear from parents, new parents, that because they became parents, once they became parents, there's this thing called the baby effect mm. <laughs> where you just become extremely motivated to do the things that maybe you hesitated to do before you became a parent, but now with this new responsibility and this person who you are just responsible for, for 18 more years and maybe even more these days, kids are returning <laughs> back from college, that you are catalyzed to become the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. That can be even a scary, a scary journey, you know, whether that's starting the business. I've, I have so many entrepreneur friends that got the urge to do this once children arrived. It sounds maybe counterintuitive because entrepreneurship is so much, in some ways, arguably more risky, riskier than a stable, quote unquote, stable nine to five, the paycheck's always coming. And yet they saw that what, what they were more afraid of was waking up one day, realizing they had so much more income potential that they could have provided so much more differently, better for their family. And they, they didn't take a bet on themselves. They didn't invest in themselves to go do that. I think kids are a beautiful reminder of what our potential is and leaning into that to parenthood as a source for motivation. Because listen, I mean, kids are expensive. Outside is expensive. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that, for example, so many single parents and single mothers raise some of the best kids, some of the most successful kids, because they don't have time to fight their fears. They have to just run with them and they have to bring them along. And usually that leads to making really important decisions and, and life-changing decisions, but always with this idea, again, because fear is coming for the ride. Fear is telling you, look for the ways to protect what you want to protect. Know what you want to value. And if you're always hearing that in your head, if you're always, if you've always got that voice in your head, then I think that's got to be an amazing, amazing compadre in life. Now, there's, of course, an excess of fear that we don't want. We don't want to feel as though we have so much of it that it overwhelms us that that can ha definitely happen. And I think that there's, I didn't write this book for those of us who do feel like absolute paralysis who probably mm. need therapy, but that is important for me to mention. Like, I think that there is a, there is a fine line, right? Between like being emotionally sort of capable and dealing with fear and knowing the tools and applying them. And then there's, you know, life is really scary for people uh, and it can be m far scarier for others. And I don't mean to minimize fear and say, hey, it's always going to be a friend. It can definitely be something that sucks you down, that, that tramples upon you. So at that point, you really need to reach out and get some help. And the help is out there. Look, everyone knows what fear is. Everyone knows how fear feels. And there's an abundance of it that like runs through our veins in rich supply. So never feel embarrassed or intimidated to admit that you are scared to someone else. They will get yeah. it and they will probably want to help. Absolutely. Yeah. You use this term, your, your book title, The Healthy State of, of Panic. Uh, how, 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 do we, how do we find that balance? Because we've described some, I mean, maybe we could describe it a little further, the, the, the polar opposites. I always look, look at the polar opposites and then find that sort of golden mean yeah. of, of the healthy state. So talk to us maybe about the polar 
polar opposites and how we can find that healthy state. Yeah, I think the I'm a journalist, Andy. So my my curiosity with anything leads me to just start asking questions. I don't I'm not the answer person. I'm the question person. <laughs> and so I lean into my strengths and I think everybody can do this. I think everybody can when fear arrives rather than what the impulse may be, which is to try to fight it or pretend you don't have it because you want to present as someone who is courageous or more powerful, that you just take a minute, it's like like seconds to go, okay, fear is here. It has arrived. It has let itself be known. I can feel it. I can hear it. I can taste it. So what, pray tell, could it want me to protect? And also, why is it here? Why has it shown up? You're really in that moment just using your fear as an opportunity to get to know yourself more, better. And isn't that what we all should do anyway? But we don't because life is busy and overwhelming. And so we forget who we are sometimes and we don't, we are not patient with ourselves and we can be quite nasty to ourselves. And so fear is really there to say, Hey, Andy, check in with yourself. Is this what you want to do? And, and sometimes the answer is, yeah, I still want to do it because you have a risk tolerance that might be different from mine. You have worked through the what ifs you have gone to maybe the dark side and said, okay, if I, if I do this thing, if I buy this house and I lose my job, this is what could happen. And I'm okay with that because I have savings or because I have some sort of safety net. Somebody else does that risk assessment and they're like, nope, not for me. Fear is just trying to get you to do those risk assessments that are really person, individual based. And that's the first step. There's not really any like crazy science to this or crazy algorithm. It's literally just accept that fear has some, maybe some valid thoughts Not always, but how you get to whether it's valid or not is you ask it questions and you probe it. And and really by probing fear, you're probing yourself and your risk tolerance and your preparedness for the dangers that you perceive may be on the other side of this move. And I think that, you know, in the book, I talk about some of the specific fears again that we have and the different wisdoms that these fears want us to extract. So whether it's the fear of loneliness or the fear of rejection, you know, there's, I say sometimes these fears are like first cousins, they buddy up. Like you're not only fearing, fearing rejection, maybe you are also fearing loneliness. Like they're not always presenting themselves in isolation, but I think that one of the things we can get smarter about is identifying what kind of fear am I feeling? And that can help be a shortcut to know, okay, here are like the three or four things that this fear typically wants me to protect or be aware of. So in the book, for example, I talk about the fear of exposure. One of my favorite chapters, I almost didn't write it. I almost didn't finish it because I was afraid of how it would be received and the reception to this because what I'm, I didn't want it to be mistaken for like, oh, Farnoosh is telling us to hold ourselves back or not go put ourselves on stage or on a limb. But I think that you know, I'm writing this book in 2020 through to 2023. And like, I feel like there's a lot in the culture about being transparent and authentic self, bringing your whole self to the world, to work, to everywhere. And I just feel like, yes, but like boundaries, <laughs> right? Not everyone deserves your vulnerability. Not everyone is prepared for your vulnerability and your honesty and your truest self. That should be reserved for like the finest of people Mm. who are elegant, who get you, who who reciprocate, who you can trust, you know, and, and there, there has to be a reading of the room before you bear all. And that's what the fear of exposure is kind of nudging you towards. So when you can identify that particular fear, and it usually shows up when someone asks you, like in my life, it's like, where are you from? Well, that's a loaded question because what, you know, I'm from a lot of places right? and that's kind of like, I have to question the motivation. Mm -hmm. Like if you asked me that, I wouldn't be suspicious because I know you and you're a nice guy. But like, you know, if I'm like when I was in the deep South Mm -hmm. in Tennessee, hungry, and the only thing open was this convenience store with the Confederate flag on the front door. I might not want to go there and strike up a conversation about how my parents are Muslim and they're mm-hmm. from Iran and I believe in women's rights. You know what I mean? So yep. I feel like it sounds maybe obvious, but so often we want to fight the fear and go, no, we're going to be courageous and just bear all. And if they can't accept who we are, well, that's their problem. But sometimes it, it ricochets and does become your problem. So do you want yeah. the distraction? Do you want the problem? I don't. I have a good life. I'm done with like trying to work through these 
other people's issues on my front doorstep. So I say that when like the fear of exposure shows up, which is the fear of like telling someone something personal about yourself that it may not be the right time, the right place, the right room, read the room. I was asked on stage at FinCon, which is listeners, a uh, annual event that brings together all the great content creators and authors and experts in personal finance. And uh, I was on a panel about making more money and negotiating as a content creator. And someone gets up in front of the audience and raises her hand and asks me, Farnoosh, how much do you make? And I was like, okay. I mean, touche. This is a panel about transparency and negotiating. <laughs> so I guess I should have been prepared. But I also was like, the fear of, of, of putting that out there was very present. It was like staring me in the face. And I, at the risk of sort of alienating her and making her feel weird. I just said, you know, I appreciate the question if you really want to know because you have something that you're currently negotiating or considering. I'm happy to get a coffee with you and talk through some of the financials of my business. But the idea of that, the expectation that I'm just going to share it with everybody here, I don't know who's in the audience. And it may seem to some like, oh, but what, what could, what's the worst that could happen? Well, I've experienced many times in my career where I, I'd be negotiating and the person on the other end of the deal maybe knows how much I made previously on this same deal. And now I'm re-upping for another quarter. Maybe it's an, a podcasting revenue deal or whatever. And they have said like, well, don't you already make enough? It's also why many states are not allowing employers to ask prospective talent and workers their previous salary and their salary history. It's not because we don't like to talk about money. It's because this can be used against you to lowball you. And so whether you're in a nine to five or you're in the entrepreneur space, I think that you have to always be weary of revealing too much about your financials to the wrong audience. I think that's great. I think, yeah, I think we just described a, a few areas where we could see boundaries for this yeah. healthy state of sharing, uh, I guess, generally and, 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 uh, fear setting and looking ways that, uh, that fit, fit for you personally. Obviously somebody might feel totally open with sharing all that information and that's, that's comfortable for them. It is. And you know, this book is not about everyone has to use fear in the yeah. same way. It's really about like, it's telling you again who you are. And if you're comfortable, go for it. It's just not who I am. And I'm grateful for fear for reminding me of who I am. It's how I achieve my sense of security and success. And it's not what we all want. And by the way, how I measure that is different how the next person measures it. So as I said, fear is very personal. Although we all experience it, how we engage should be personal because no two people are the same. And I think that's good for us all to remember as human beings, citizens, uh, just fellow colleagues, everybody is different and unique. And going through this process, there's probably somebody listening saying, you know what, this sounds like a very cathartic process for me to take the time to think about what these fears are and how they could maybe propel me or how they're holding me back. Could you give somebody some small steps, just one takeaway mm -hmm. of like how they would start that process? Is this journaling? Is this, is this therapy? What, what, <laughs> what is this for people? Or I guess maybe a small step people could take following this interview. Well, I think there is a benefit to writing things down. I'm not a journaler, but if that's what you want to do, do it. I think there is, whether you put it in your notes in your phone or you have a pen and a paper, but I think documenting what is it that you're afraid of in your financial life? Let's just take our financial lives because there's many things we could talk about as far as what I'm afraid of the ocean. Okay. But we're not talking about that. I'm let's talk about money. What is the thing that you're afraid of when it comes to money? And then write it down. And then the next prompt is I'm afraid of this because, and then read it out loud and then challenge it. Is it that you're afraid of this because you actually experienced something terrifying around this that would give you pause, that you failed at something in this area of your life, whether it's investing or paying off debt or earning or what have you, that's giving you pause, that's making you frightened? Or did you inherit this fear from others? And others is your parents, your caregivers, social media, your friends, colleagues. I think that when often we fear something, it may have come to us almost like a, like a virus, like we caught it. It was a bug. And we need to work through and out of that. 
And how you do is you decide now that you're an adult, whether you're going to continue this fear narrative or not. And I would say that if you have different goals, if this fear is not aligned, if this fear is holding you back and that is not helping you achieve your goals, then you should rewrite that fear. You should rewrite your that relationship that you have with that fear. Like I grew up never seeing women model financial independence around me in so far as like having their own money, making their own financial decisions. And so, you know, I did grow up to be somebody. And then as a result, I wanted to be like the opposite of that because I saw also how it would lead to complications for women and families. So I became determined to be an independent, financially independent woman. But I'll be honest, I was afraid of making quote unquote too much. You know, like I just felt like if I made too much, which means like maybe doubling my income, that others would think that I had my priorities mixed up, that it was going to hundred percent come at the expense of my time with my family. And I didn't want to sacrifice that. I worked with a money coach and it wasn't because of this, but she kind of extracted this from me. She was like, why don't you want to be a millionaire? And I was like, oh, that's not who I am. Hmm. I had all these sort of negative associations mm -hmm. with what it meant to be a rich woman. And that wasn't because I experienced it personally, but because I saw it in the, like, you know, do you watch Bravo? Like all those women, you know, they're like, they're these sort of like misguided rich women. And I think like, so the media doesn't help us in that yeah. regard either. We sort of grew up with these like, you know, ideas of what it means to be rich and powerful and ew. And she was like, listen, it sounds like you need to rework some of that narrative because you have a lot of potential. And what if I just offered you this, that when you make more, you can inherit more power, not like the ugly power that we see depicted on television, like the, the oil tycoon at the top of the tower, making everyone's life miserable, but the power to uplift, the power to heal, the power to support. I think that's more of who you are. And so all this to say that it was a journey, it was like rewriting that narrative, figuring out the root of the fear. Is it true? Is it fair to let, like, keep it going? You know, And is it holding me back? Yes, it was, and unfairly. And so I decided to say that I'm a woman who's completely entitled to making more, that I should make more, and that making more is gonna help others, not just myself. And that empowered me. But I will say too, that when I went about to try to make the money, I didn't just like start not sleeping and scaling like crazy and hiring. Like, I was very thoughtful about how I did it because I still wanted to protect what was important to me. Like that fear didn't go away. It was like, okay, you're going to do this? Great. Okay. So protect your time, protect your relationships. And how I did that was one, I just started asking for more money. Try it. It's life-changing. You don't <laughs> think you can do it. If you're afraid of asking for more money, that's a good sign that you're asking for the right amount. And that doesn't take any effort. It's just, just, just takes deciding. I invested in a, an assistant, which yes, is an investment, but then immediately I saw ROI and it freed up my time to think more strategically about the business instead of being in the weeds of things and keeping status quo. It could grow. And yeah, those were like the two things that I did immediately that again, like I still got to be home with my kids. I still got to like cook occasionally, which I love to do. I still got to have time for myself, have time with my husband and I was making more money. Imagine that. So I myself have, I'm the product of this. I, I, I have very intimate personal relationship with fear, not just as a kid, but every day I'm, I'm reckoning with fear. I'm unpacking it to help me be the best version of myself. And now you're an example to women out there about I hope uh, so. different ways to be a financially independent yeah. woman, a millionaire woman, right? to do, do the things that you want to do in your life, to be the change that you want to see in the mm -hmm. world. Um, I love that. Farnoosh, tell us uh, more about this book and where people can get it. Thank you. So the book is called A Healthy State of Panic. You can buy it at all your favorite local bookstores. You can go to a healthystateofpanic.com, a healthystateofpanic.com to learn more about it. I'd love for you to follow me on Instagram. That's where I hang out most. I cannot figure out TikTok. I have <laughs> I don't want to say I've given up, but it's it's kind of a lost cause at this point. I gave up. You know? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good on Instagram. Uh, meet me at my podcast, So Money. Thank you, Andy. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. Yeah, easiest thing to do if you guys are listening, type in So Money. That way you can connect with Farnoosh immediately. Farnoosh, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. <laughs>